thank you so much. Um, it's great to be here. Um, Paul Chambers actually has a little bit of acreage in Georgia, too, so we feel like we're, we've straddled both states, and I actually spend most of my time up in the Georgia uh, portion working, uh, working on uh, a property up there that we have access to here. Um, I hate to stop all these wonderful slides of great plants going on. I'm going to switch over to my presentation here right now. The birds are almost as colorful as plants. That's one of the reasons I, I study them. They're, they're pretty popular because of their uh, visual appeal. And also, it turns out that birds are very, um, very good indicators, oftentimes, of uh, habitat conditions and what's taking place in the environment. So I talked my, uh, my talk today is Burning for Birds, How Feathers and Fires Naturally Mix. Uh, at Tall Timbers, uh, we got our start studying the effects of fire on wildlife and plants. And we continue to do that work today. It's a never ending uh, studies that we do on, on fire and its effects on different organisms. Um, and we're going to be talking today about the birds again and the fire effects on birds. Um, I love this picture. Um, it shows uh, something that we don't get to see much of anymore. Um, someone dwarfed by a bunch of tall, uh, grim trees. This is a shot of a longleaf forest over Louisiana taken in the late 1800s. Uh, this forest type used to extend from Virginia down to south central Florida, out to eastern Texas. It covered about uh, the lower third of Georgia. Uh, it covered 90 million acres, and it was the largest coniferous forest system in North America. Um, and uh, it was very extensive. It has a high species richness, higher species richness than almost any forest type in North America. And now it's almost virtually gone. <clears throat> There's only about 3 million acres of lonely forest left in the southeast. Um, but this harkens back to what uh, the, the old growth stands used to look like around the southeast. Uh, the tree lives a long time, 500, 600 years, it's not unusual for this uh, tree to live. Here's another picture of a lonely forest out in Pensacola, Florida. And again, the things you note, similar to the previous photograph, big trees, but also wide open spaces. And this is a, a grassland, in an essence, with these uh, lonely pines towering above the grasslands. Not much mid-story, it looks fairly open, and that's one of the features of this habitat cap, is that it's very open and combines elements of both the forest type with the grassland type, and that's an important thing that drives some of the species richness in this system. I want to talk about some important concepts in talking about fire and longleaf and maybe how the two interact. Um, first of all, longleaf does not have these sort of crazy uh, timber killing storms like we see out west and in some forest system. If the uh, system longleaf is a very slow, uh, low intensity ground fire that very rarely affects the canopy. Here's a picture of a burn that we're conducting on the wave track. You see the flame length is not much over three to six feet in height, slowly moving through the ground cover, basically not affecting your trees again, but basically uh, killing off the, the, the plants at, at ground level. We call that top kill. The plants will re-sprout and actually get back to be, be about the same height they were within about a month to, uh, to six weeks. But basically, the fire sweeps through, uh, resets the ground cover, and keeps this sort of interaction going. You know, with, with the, it's been going on for a long time, too. Estimates are that the fires have been working through the longleaf system for about 60,000 years. So the plants and animals that are in the system are naturally adapted to fire, and we'll talk about that today, too, particularly with birds. What happens when these fires move through, there's a very brief pulse of very high temperatures, only for about a minute to two minutes. On the lower graph down here, it just shows the temperature. We had some these measurements out there as the fire is moving through. You can see it's pretty, pretty low temperature. Then suddenly, it spikes up to about 800 to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, only for about a minute, from 55 to 56 and a half minutes. So it's a very short-term period where this fire comes through there and makes that very high elevated temperature at, at ground level. That's enough to kill off the oaks and some other things but and remove the top vegetation, but it's not long enough to sit there and, and kill the overstory of, of longleaf. Here's what it looks like afterwards. You can see again, some of the you know, young longleaf, some of the trees they are scorched naturally down low. The bars, you can see the greenery up in the tops of the trees uh, still present. And so again, this forest type of fire uh, basically affects the ground cover and not the overstory of trees. So what we're doing when we're burning, we're basically recycling this, um, this ground cover. If you start looking from the left going to the right, as time since fire occurs, if, you know, the fire comes through and kills off all the ground cover vegetation. It slowly starts to grow back, and then about once every three years, you reset a fire and it comes back and kills off that ground cover vegetation. Again, so we're resetting the area down to ground level. And this is actually pretty important because this is where all the plant diversity, the animal diversity lies in this particular system. 
There are over 450 different species of plants in the long leaf system, most of them from your waist down. Uh, there are about 100 different species of birds that make use of the long leaf system. And again, about 40% of these birds are focused on this ground cover level. So again, 100 species of birds, pretty diverse system, and 40% of these are associated with that shrub ground cover level. The other 60% are in the uh, mid-story, which is kind of in that 15 to 25 foot range, and then up higher into the canopy, where about 35% of the birds are associated actually with the, uh, the canopy portion of the forest. Now we talk about fire frequency, and by that we mean how frequently a fire comes through an area, and uh, this concept is um, very important in, in this system. How often do you put fire in an area? So this shows in dark gray the upland pines on tall timbers, um, we burn very much. So in 2004, the light green areas you've seen here were all the acreage on tall timbers that we burned. Uh, it was about a little over half the property. In 2005, the dark green areas show the area that we burned in 2005. It's basically everything that wasn't burned in 2004, plus a little bit more. And then in 2006, the yellow shows again what we burned that year, which is uh, again a little, uh, covers up some of the, um, of the previous areas in light green, but also leaves a few out. Basically on tall timbers, we burn about 60% of the property every year. Uh, and this sort of high frequency returns, that means that we have about a two year return interval or two year fire frequency that we're using on tall timbers. A little bit less since we burn over 50%. But the main point here, this fire frequency gives you some idea about the total percentage of the property that's being burned. So if you have a one year return interval, that means you're burning every year, so 100% of your upland pines get burned. If you have a four year interval, you're having about 25% that you're burning at any one time. And so these sort of percentages are really important. If you're managing 100,000 acres and you're trying to maintain a three year fire return interval, you've got to burn 33,000 acres each year in order to achieve that goal. Okay, back to this forest. What was the frequency you guess my uh, fires may have occurred in, in Longleaf? Anyone got an idea? Naturally, it's been happening for 60,000 years, and we actually have some estimates go back uh, many, many centuries from now. It's really high. It's really high. Gene Huffman, who is a graduate student at Louisiana State University, was able to find some of these old stumps, uh, Longleaf stumps up in the panhandle. These were big old trees that actually were alive in, back in the 1600s. And they had these small, small scars on one side of them where the fire had come through, it had wounded the tree, the tree would heal itself, but you could actually see, going back to the 1600s, where the fires had come through the area. Based on her stuff, she gave uh, the average return interval for fire, which was every two to three years. This is back before there was a heavy European presence here in North Florida and South Georgia. And the variability in frequency was pretty low. About 92% of the fires came through every, uh, more frequently than every five years. So again, it's very frequently turned by fires. The fires were ignited by lightning. You know, we have this period we're coming into now in April, going into May and June, where we sort of dry out from these winter storms passing through. And we come to this dry period, uh, fairly low rainfall until we start to get these thunderstorms coming in, you know, later in the summer. During that period, the first few thunderstorms coming through could hit a tree and this tree would catch on fire and they start emitting sparks. And you think about this grassy ground cover we had, that fire could get started up and would carry for thousands and thousands of, of acres. So looking at Florida, I have a lot of Florida examples, uh, not many, as many in Georgia, I apologize for that, but the same stuff holds true here in Georgia as well too. These are the different sorts of habitat types we have in Florida that were influenced by fire. We have longleaf pine, we have mixed pine hardwoods. There are some prairie lands in Florida which are basically large grasses that don't have any trees on them, and then other types of forests. If you calculate all this stuff up by their fire intervals, the bright red showing those that naturally would have received about a two to three year return frequency. The lighter pinkish, uh, three to five, and then the grayish uh, things that burned every 10 to 25 years. About 25% 20 of Florida burned annually. Just it had to in order to maintain these sort of frequencies. And again, these systems are things that the, uh, the plants and uh, animals have evolved to to deal with. So I talked a little bit about some of for birds anyway, some of the community level processes, and then I'll start focusing on <clears throat> the effects of fire on individual species and some other topics. We have, um, again, we study fire at tall timbers, and we have a lot of research plots that we've set on the station. One of those is called NB66, which basically says not burned since 1966. <clears throat> this is a 25-acre portion of tall timbers, which we've carved out, and we haven't let fire come into the area in over 40 years. 
So looking at the top slide, that shows MB66 as a look back in 1966. You can see the open grasslands with the pines interspersed uh, uh, there. The second slide in 1981, if you look in the A in the upper corner here, this is the same tree in both images. You can see how, how uh, the lack of fire, you get that sort of thick hardwood coming in, uh, taking over the vegetation. No longer the grasses are, are there. It's starting to be shaped out by these hardwoods. Again, fire coming through regularly, that brief burst of heat that you have where it gets up to 800 degrees is enough to kill off an oak. The oak will re-sprout, but you keep killing it off and it keeps uh, uh, suppressing it. If you let it go, that oak suddenly uh, is not, uh, starts growing and eventually reaches up into a, uh, become a higher stature of the tree. And then this show in the lower slide the uh, picture of 19, uh, MB66 now in 2001. Well, we've done counts on MB66 of the birds. Uh, up in the upper left-hand corner, you can see four species that disappear very quickly when fire was removed. <clears throat> the acronyms up there stand for loggerhead shrike, uh, eastern kingbird, blue grosbeak, and then backwood sparrow. And these are things that just, would, uh, once you remove fire, these animals disappear within two to three years after the fire has been removed. They don't show back up until the ground cover conditions are uh, turned back to the grassy state that they were in. If you look down the lower right, you see all sorts of birds that start to show up later in, in, in the system. Uh, and again, the acronyms are Twitter Warbler, Red Iberio, Northern Perula, Wood Thrush. And these are birds that like a hardwood forest. They start to show up, you know, uh, as that hardwood starts to develop and matures and become a very uh, a component, a prominent uh, component of the, of the system itself. <coughs> now, you may think that when you're burning, you're simply substituting one group of species with another group of species. But in the southeast, actually, those pinelands have many more species than the hardwood forests that we have here in the southeast. So this is just a look at species richness on MB66, showing it was up around 35 different types of birds when, the, uh, when it was that grassy open pineland. It's now dwindled to, to just 20 species of birds or so at a time. So you're not really replacing, you are replacing birds with different types of birds, but you're actually losing species richness when you really remove fire from these uh, mature pinelands. Now, there are a hundred different species of birds that occur in these pinelands, and I'm not going to bore you with talking about every single one. So I've, I've developed a refined list of species that I tend to focus most of my efforts on. And these are birds that are uh, declining populations, uh, are rare for some other reasons, and we call them species of special concern throughout the southeast. So what I've done, uh, this graph shows um, different, the state, oh, every state in the southeast has developed these lists of species of special concern. So I went through and I took Alabama, Florida, Georgia, all the states in the southeast, and ticked off the number of the different species that I had lifted as concern. And so if you look at the top, that top tier of like six species ranked highly among all these states. And these are the birds I tend to focus most of my time on. Up in the upper left hand corner, you can see red cacao woodpecker, backman sparrow, Henslow sparrow, logger headed shrike, northern bob white, and brown headed nuthatch, uh, and grasshopper sparrow, too, to a lesser degree. I'd also like to point out that Alabama only found four of these species to be uh, concerned. I think they're being really conservative in Alabama. <laughs> they have many more species that are actually concerned over there. But uh, of course, in Georgia and Florida, have about the same number. But this is how I, this is from a, a this, this group of birds I tend to focus my time on because they're declining and the stuffed information we can produce at tall timbers can help to guide management on, on uh, public lands to improve populations for these animals. So the first one, this is really the uh, flagship species of the open pine woods, the red cacao woodpecker. It's not the big bird, it's only about eight inches in height. Um, it's characterized, the uh, main field marks are this bright white cheek patch that you can see there. <clears throat> the other black and white woodpeckers that we have here in the southeast tend to have a black line <clears throat> that comes through the eye there and doesn't have that white cheek patch. This is a bird that's very special. Uh, it makes a living, uh, it excavates its cavities openly in living pine trees. It's the only bird in North America that does that and, and practically the world. Um, it requires a big old pine tree to have enough space in the interior for this bird to have make uh, its living quarters, uh, roughly about a 15 to 16 inch tree minimum. And it uh, takes a tree about 90 years to reach that point. So this bird is dependent on what we call old growth uh, timber, uh, mature old growth timber. Now it gets us, here's what the living quarters look like up on the upper right. So basically the bird works at uh, uh, an entrance canal that works upwards. 
It's very important because if rain comes down along the tree and if that tunnel were facing downward, basically water will pour into the cavity and flood up the cavity, <coughs> so it, it sort of angles it upwards. And then you see the cavity itself, this cross section, it goes down about eight to 12 inches or so. Each individual woodpecker in a, in a territorial group has its own cavity. So any woodpecker territory, you have anywhere from six to eight of these cavities that the birds have excavated in a tree. The other interesting thing on the left there, you can see that that's a replicated cavity with the entrance hole showing up. Uh, up. You see the entrance hole way up uh, just above the sap, but this white wash that's all along the tree is sap. Each morning, the birds, when they come out of their cavity after sweeping, they basically re-wound the tree, making the little uh, uh, pecking on the exterior of the cavity entrance, opening a hole, uh, opening into the canyon of the tree, and so the sap flows, and that sap actually deters certain animals from getting into their cavities. Lion squirrels uh, love to get into the cavities of red cave woodpecker, but with that sap, you think about your being a furry little mammal and having yourself coated in the sap, it's not a very pleasant situation. Uh, rat snakes and other things can climb up in these trees as well, and this, uh, this barrier that the bird produces at this point uh, prevents those animals from getting into their cavity. I'd also like to point out, people wonder how I got the name Red Cacated. It's, it's not a very showy bird to be honest with you. The males have these two or three little red feathers at the back of the head. The females don't have those, and that's where the bird gets its name from. So it's not a very prominent display, but that's where the, that's where the name comes from. One thing we like about woodpeckers is, you know, they require mature timber, but they also uh, require large areas of timber. A territorial group will cover 120 to 200 acres, and you start to think about all the other organisms that might live in that area, along with the, we just they where a single territorial group of replicates occur. They could be up to 80 gopher tortoises, uh, dozens and scores of batman sparrows, hensel sparrows, <coughs> pocket gophers, <coughs> almost 200 species of plants in some places. Uh, and several, so the bird serves as a, if we have a good uh, population of red cockades in place, you can rest assured that a lot of these other organisms are going to be well conserved. So we consider it to be a keystone species for this purpose. Now, it spends its time up in the canopy, and you might think that burning has another end of the thing in the world to do with red cockaded woodpeckers, but that's totally wrong. Fire is essential for this bird. The bird makes a living by eating ants that uh, spend a portion of their life history down in the ground cover. And we've been shown pretty, pretty conclusively that burning frequently helps encourage the ant diversity that makes its way up into the tree. Uh, if you stop burning, those ants disappear from the ground level, the light doesn't get down the ground where they are, and they don't get up into the trees. So one thing, first of all, the very ants that these birds eat um, is a higher diversity when you have more frequent burning. The other thing that's really important is, is those hardwoods start to come into that ground level yeah, they look nice and green, but they also absorb a lot of carb, um, calcium uh, from the soil. <clears throat> and they, the calcium makes its way into the leaves, and it's basically sequestered there in the plant. <clears throat> when fire comes through, kills off that vegetation, it releases this calcium back into the soil, and it's picked up by ants and a lot of other things. And surprisingly, red cockaded woodpeckers always lay an extra egg the year after fire because there's more calcium up there in, in, in the environment. It's a very interesting chemical relationship between the, the woodpeckers and the, uh, the, uh, the, the birding. So again, even though this bird spends its life up in the canopy, what you're doing at ground cover can have a good pronounced effect on it. So we uh, uh, like to see a lot of fire going in when you have replicated. This is the young birds. We take them out at about day seven to ban them. They're not very attractive looking at this point. <laughs> Pretty naked, they're blind, and this is, but this is the point where we can uh, deal with them most easily uh, and ban them, put them back in the cavity. But again, that release of calcium could affect a lot of birds in which they have, and increase their productivity in the year following fire. Now, I mentioned that lightning strikes fires, starting fires historically, and, and again, the time that when these fires occurred naturally were probably in this sort of April through June period. Um, as uh, we add humans to the mix, we start burning at other times when it's a little more convenient for us, such as right now. It's cooler, we have these steady winds out of the north, and so uh, human fires are oftentimes a lot earlier than the natural fires. And we tend to distinguish these two between sort of uh, what we call um, anthropogenic or human fires versus the lightning season fires, which are more natural. This slide shows a graph of the fires that were conducted on the uh, Apalachicola National Forest just south of Tallahassee. And you can see when they're burning down there, they're mostly burning in March and April. Uh, but when they look at when the natural lightning fires come, those are the wildfires that creep up 
Those don't start happening until April and May, so they're burning a little earlier. One other thing that people have always been concerned about, there's an increasing shift on public lands to, to using these lightning season fires. Uh, they do a little bit better job of controlling the hardwoods. There are certain plant species, such as wiregrass, that won't even flower unless you burn um, later in the season. And so this is a, a common practice term, but a lot of people have been concerned about what effects this might have on the birds, because April and May, obviously, are very important breeding birds at uh, times for, for the birds. So we've been looking at this a lot uh, in, in some of my work, um, just showing, up again, on the upper uh, left, when the fires occur up on the uh, National Forest, bright blue being sort of that May-June period versus the red where the human fires are. And this just shows when a lot of birds are nesting. May and June are real peak periods for a lot of the birds that are nesting in this long leaf system. Two of these are shown here. The upper one um, on the right is batten sparrows, and the one on the uh, lower right is the uh, brown-headed nuthatch that we'll be talking about. Now, most of the work I've done is on this wonderful track we call the Wade Track, um, <coughs> just south of Thomasville. It's an old growth, mature, longleaf forest. It's one of the um, only about 12 or so forest types like this left in the southeast. It's a great place to, to study these effects. One thing we ask always, you know, what happens if you burn during the season? You know, what are the effects on some of the animals? Um, the point here is that we, conduct, <clears throat> we conducted a study several years ago where we looked at the bird diversity just before fire was put in in June, and then we, or excuse me, in May. And then we looked at the return of birds after the fire was conducted. And just looking at something like quail, prior to the burn, you can see the quail numbers down there, there were about two of them per acre. One to three weeks after the burn, the quail numbers started to peak, and you'd start looking at six to eight weeks after the burns, actually the quail were more abundant after the fire than they were before the fire started. So yeah, the fire comes in and eliminates vegetation, but it's important to consider the long-term, oh, thanks. The long-term benefits always outweigh the short-term negatives of that uh, with birds when you're talking about fire. So again, short-term setbacks outweigh by the long-term gains. So we're going to talk about batman sparrow now. Uh, this is a little bird on the left there. It's known for having one of the most gorgeous songs in the southeast, and I think I can pull it up here. Let me give this a try. One more time. Oops. Nope, I'm not going to be able to do it. It's not. I'm going to try one more time here. <laughs> it's that important. As is the introductory note, followed by a brow, a trill. And they get a little more elaborate there too with that little uh, in ending note there on there. So it's known as this, uh, the pinewood songster. It's a very pretty call. It's a pretty drab looking bird uh, just, just sitting there, but it does have a little bit of color. That, that brown back and actually the wings have these bright yellow spots is, is that they sort of use like uh, red winged blackbirds. I don't know if you've ever seen red winged blackbirds in March. That flare, that red spot on the wing up <clears throat> when they're chasing one another. Magnet spares do the same thing with that yellow patch. So it's been declining throughout its range and it's restricted to our pine systems here in the southeast. <coughs> Prior to our work, the conventional wisdom about these lightning season burns and backwood sparrows were they thought they were burning up a bunch of nests. This bird nests on the ground and anything fire that happens on the ground is naturally going to kill the nest. Uh, in one study they found that the birds left the area and never returned. So there's been a lot of concern and, and actually for a while people were saying that you shouldn't be burning during the natural lightning season out of concern for backwood sparrows. So we did some studies on this bird looking actually at the nest sites. It turns out that every nest that we could find was in an area that had been burned within the last 10 months. You got to 12 months and you start to, it's very um, difficult to find a nest. We only found a few nests and things were over 10 months. It turns out that what an important component of the ground cover for the nest of this bird is it likes a lot of bare ground. It's, a, it's, it's, it's basically a little avian rat that runs along the ground, and if you get a buildup of the ground cover, it doesn't, it doesn't have the space it needs to be get between the, the grasses and stuff. It just becomes too clogged. And we took a lot of measurements around the nest. Uh, we took an at the nest site, and then we also measured the same sorts of things 
two months after fire, six months after fire, 12, and then 18 months to get an idea of what, how that post-burn succession of the plants uh, relates to the nest site structure. I don't want to show too many data slides, but this is a, these are box plots that basically show, this is the percent bare ground shown on the y-axis. <clears throat> so the nest sites have about seven to eight uh, percent bare ground. This shows the mean and the range of the var variables. <clears throat> and as you can see, as you start to burn, uh, go away from the burn time, that ground cover comes go up, clogged up, there's less bare ground. We're actually out to about 16, 18 months. You have a very small percentage of bare ground around the nest sites. So the implications of this are pretty important. <coughs> Once again, that shows on the left the, um, the um, really soon after burn within six months. You can see the way the grass stands erect, and there's all this sort of interstitial area that the birds can move through. And then this shows again 18 months after burning how clogged up the ground cover is. And you can imagine if you're a small 12, uh, 20 gram sparrow trying to work through the, <laughs> that, that vegetation, it can be a pretty tough slog. So if you're burning every two years, you're burning way out here. There are no birds, there are no nests out there. Uh, the nests are all in the area that you burned last year, not the area that you plan to burn this year. So any concerns about burning up a bunch of botany sparrows' nests by these lightning season burns are, are unfounded. There are very few birds that are, that are nesting out there. There are some singing males. Those are the loser males. <laughs> they're out there singing with their heads off. There are no females out there nesting. The birds are out there just trying to attract the female. The females wouldn't be caught dead in those areas because the, the ground cover is just too thick. <laughs> The other thing about batting sparrows too is if you put a fire through an area in April and May, you get a very lush response from a duck or different plants. Uh, you know, wiregrass flowers in, the lopsided Indian grasses, a big profusion of, of plant response flowering that takes place with those types of birds. And these actually can benefit the birds uh, with their uh, winter abundances. I don't want to spend too much, but the, this shows, uh, the gray area shows the areas that were burned and the dots do these, are these places where we do counts of bat and sparrows uh, in the winter. So the bright red means there are a bunch of sparrows there, the yellow means that there are very few sparrows there. The area that was burned always had the highest abundance of sparrows in winter. So again, it, the, the long-term gains that are provided by burning uh, outweigh the short-term. And also, in fact, with this particular bird, you're not burning up nests, you're actually creating areas where the, the bird can breed. Some of the other sparrows, uh, I really love sparrows. Uh, they look like little brown jaws, but you get them in the hand and all of a sudden those little brown things turn into colors of bronze, gold, saffron, sage, all these wonderful colors. There's some other species out there, also wintering sparrows. On the left, the grasshopper sparrow. On the right, my favorite, the Henslow sparrow. It's a very colorful bird. Uh, these birds also tend to favor areas that have recent burns in winter because, again, there's that prolific seeding that the flowers uh, uh, put together that, that provides a very rich uh, winter seed source. I was once getting a field trip a few uh, weeks ago. We netted a Henslow sparrow, and suddenly the sun broke out and it shone down. These birds had this wonderfully olive-colored head, and you could hear each person in the group going, ooh, uh, whenever the sunlight hit, hit the head of the bird. Okay, moving on to one of my other favorite birds, uh, the brown-headed nuthatch. Um, this is a real curious bird. It's smaller than any of the sparrows. It's about 10 grams. It's about one of the smallest songbirds we have. And it's basically um, a big head with the minimum amount of feathering and musculature needed to get that head through the forest. <laughs> um, it's basically it's like a small woodpecker. It, it pecks it and it, it likes to work with red wood. It pecks a lot. There's also some other curious, it's one of the only birds in North America that uses tools. You can see birds flying around, they'll sometimes take a twig and push it underneath the bar. It also has a cooperative breeding system where young stay around with the adults to help them raise additional young. This bird, uh, same thing in Georgia as for here, again, they listen to species of concern because it's going downhill. Uh, the, one, the graph on the upper right shows the trends for this species along uh, some surveys that are done throughout North America. And the one on the left that just shows how this bird used to occur throughout Florida. Now it's pretty much almost eliminated south of Orlando. Now this bird nests low, it also nests early. It nests starting more, in fact, the research we're doing right now, about half the territories on tall timbers have eggs right now, and we also have some young going on tall timbers. It likes, it excavates a cavity in a dead piece of uh, stump or something, and the, nest, the cavities are very low to the ground. 
So this shows one of the, uh, actually a, a nest that success, successfully fledged terminal tall timber several years ago. And that nest is only a foot and a half off the ground. So again, this bird is nesting actually before those natural lightning season fires would have come through. It's, it's already fledged young by that May to June window when these fires would have naturally uh, been ignited. So when, 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 with our anthropogenic burning that we're doing now, a lot of times we're actually burning up the nest of this particular bird. It just shows that he, uh, one of the stumps that the bird has. And they, unlike the, a lot of other species, this bird tends not to re-nest. They basically take a huge shot, a uh, huge gamble with a single nest, and they very rarely re-nest. So actually, uh, when you think about lightning season burns um, versus anthropogenic burns, this bird probably was historically was trying to get its nest done before the burns came through naturally. And so it's a very early nester. And again, the lightning season birds don't really pose a threat to actually provoke, uh, <coughs> provide a, a distinct benefit for this species. The other thing is too that um, when those burns come through, those birds are nesting right now and the snakes haven't really started to emerge from hibernation. If you start to get past April 15th or so, the snakes start to come out. <laughs> those low nests are sitting ducks for a lot of the snakes that are out and about. And we find this oftentimes, uh, lower left, that's one of my females in the st stomach of a, gray, a red rat snake. And on the right, not a very pleasing uh, image, but uh, that's a female that I'm actually palpating out of a gray rat snake. And we find that oftentimes if the females are nesting past roughly April 15th, they have a higher incidence of being uh, depredated by snakes. So again, this bird is, it's very important you, you, to let this bird go uh, nest early and actually Fires that are set in sort of that May to June window are actually avoiding the time when this bird's nesting. Now, a lot of this information I've been talking about today is provided in a pamphlet we have called Lightning Season Burning, Friend or Foe of Breeding Birds. It's available on our website as a PDF. Uh, we published this uh, several years ago, uh, and uh, every week ran out of copies very quickly. <clears throat> So the lightning season burns don't pose a threat really to a lot of these breeding birds. And actually there's an important reason for uh, thinking about using those or mixing those in with your management of sites. Um, first of all, they are more efficient in controlling hardwoods. They create good conditions for longleaf seedlings to uh, hit the ground and become established. You know, longleaf sets its seed in October and November. If you burn very early in sort of like that February, March window, sometimes that vegetation is very thick come November and the seeds never have a chance to reach the ground. By burning in June, that vegetation and skin is going to be sort of sparse, more sparse when those seeds start are, are shed in that fall period and actually have a greater chance of hitting the ground and uh, establishing. But the main reason I always like to uh, really stress the importance of lightning season burning in addition to its natural benefits, it expands opportunities for burning. The fact that you have a few more months each year that you might consider burning, it can be very important for uh, increasing the acreage burned each year. And that's really one of the th um, chief things that a lot of people who manage public land, land space is not getting quite the acreage burned each year that they really need to. Here's an example. Um, this is called the Big Pine Track in Hernando County, Florida. It kind of looks like MB66. <laughs> you don't see the open pines, you don't see the grassing qualities you know that we have. This place has actually not been burned uh, nearly frequently enough, and it's a very uh, thick hardwood area that's dominated by longleaf that has all these other hardwoods in there. As an example uh, of the problems we face in managing public lands, um, getting the acreage burned each year can be real troublesome. It's very easy for someone to, uh, if there's any block, any roadblock to burning, uh, it's very easy just not to, 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 to burn. And we see that a lot in Florida and Georgia uh, in the management of some of our public lands. This is an example of Wicklifucci State Forest. It's at 50,000 acres, and it's got a lot, mostly longleaf uh, dominant. Um, ideally, they should be burning uh, about uh, 15 to 20,000 uh, acres each year if they want to maintain a two to three year fire return interval here. Uh, their burn goal is over only 11,000, so that immediately puts them in a one in five year. They're already getting behind and they very rarely reach that goal. Uh, over the past 18 years, the burn goal has only been reached in five of, the, uh, five of the years. So this place is going a long time without receiving the fires it needs to sustain some of these organisms. And here's the results, no big surprise here. Things like brown headed nuthatch, batman sparrow, bob white quail have been going down on this particular forest now for, for decades. Uh, in fact, the nuthatch no longer occurs on the site. It hasn't been recorded there in over 25 years, and again, Unless we can keep these fire frequencies and maintain them on a lot of public lands, this is a scenario that's going to play out in a lot of other areas. 
So again, the fires are very important. The short-term setbacks are always outweighed by the long-term gains. Uh, it's the main take-home message for today. Um, fires, uh, uh, you know, just remove that ground cover. Uh, there's a lot of other organisms that need this open condition at ground level, such as the gopher tortoise, uh, the many snakes, uh, ant diversity, um, a lot of herps uh, make, make use of these areas. And it's very important, you know, to keep the fire coming in there as frequently as possible in these, in these uh, pineland systems we have in the southeast. This is again a picture of the wave track. It's a wide open system. Uh, the trees are spaced at a moderate distance with the grassy carpet you know, beneath the trees. And one thing I always like to point out, well, we talk about fires being the disturbance, but in our southern pinelands, it's the lack of fire that is the disturbance. It's not that they're putting a the fire in that does any disturbance. It's a natural thing. Again, it's been happening for thousands and thousands of years, and all the organisms that are associated with these systems are intimately linked to the, to the burning that takes place. So um, I'll leave it with that right there, and uh, thanks for your attention, and I'll try to answer any questions that there may be out there. Yes, ma'am. In Georgia, in certain areas, we are planting long pines as plantations. Everyone had a question of uh, planting along leaf and, and uh, commercially. Those uh, the, the very thick long leaf plantings, you know, with largely for fiber or something, a lot of these organisms can't make it. They need an open system. Planting a lot of long leaf in an area and then opening them up, say 25 to 30 years later, then these animals will move in. But if it's a, if it's a sort of operation where you're planting, growing them for a while, and then removing them all at once. That's not going to provide benefit for these. I mean, that's a perfectly legitimate land use, but that's not for these particular organisms going to, going to uh, provide the habitat that they need. But thinning them will help. Yes, in fact, that's one of the big things that we recommend for heavily, thickly planted long leaf stands is to thin them back um, to what we call a basal area of 40 or 60, <clears throat> which basically means probably about 35 to 50 trees per acre rather than 600 trees per acre. Now, I've not discussed with you, because there are, is that what you're saying? 